Hey, I had sent an email yesterday. Okay, then then uh, I will go through the walkthrough for both the quotes. I had actually sent an email to the whole class. I remember. <laughs> so I will, I will I will check it out with uh, ERP guys. What happened with that? And I say categorically figured out that the best way is to send you an email and remind you. Hmm? Push it on. Bring the cursor to this side and then scroll. Cursor to this side, click, scroll. Okay. Uh, so essentially, the point is that I would announce in a class if I am going to do a tutorial in the next class. Okay. Now we did a hands-on tut. We did that pen and paper calculation on the previous class, which was on uh, Thursday. We were also supposed to do this part, which could not be completed because it took you time to finish off the pen and paper. So obviously this has to be done before I make a move to the next one because this is essentially for your forward pass or model declaration. Okay. Now the point is until you end up writing your codes on model declaration, we cannot make the next for next next movement on to what is that optimization phase of it. Okay. For that reason, though I had announced in the class that bring it, but then everybody was busy going out at on Thursday after the class. So I, I thought like let me send an email. So yesterday night I had sent an email, but if it has not reached anybody, then I will have to check with uh, ERP on what happened with that because this is a bit fishy. So that email had a lot of instructions including like what to bring to the class, what all configurations to be done on your laptop and every every preparation instruction was actually kept in that email. So I will send that again today. What we will do is today we are going to do a walkthrough over this whole code base. So there are two parts of it. One is to define a fully connected neural network. Another is to define a convolutional neural network. Okay. Now this is just definition part of it. We are not yet getting into the optimization of the solver part of it. Okay. Wednesday when you come to the class, please bring your laptops configured with Anaconda, Python, PyTorch and everything. Okay. Get these two codes executed as well. If you are not able to get any part of it done, then raise a query in the class. First 30 minutes of the class we will devote to uh, getting these queries for the hands-on part solved. Okay. So, uh, now within Torch, this is, uh, I mean Python is an object oriented programming language. So you need to call down your objects of whatever you want to do. And Torch is uh, one of those specific libraries which is used for defining neural networks and doing it. Now nonetheless, this is not the only one. You can use TensorFlow within Python as well. You can use MXNet within Python. You can use uh, Cafe within Python. There are numerous of these libraries which are available over there. Okay. But we are going to stick to PyTorch for uh, uh, an intrinsic simplicity. Let's let's assume for now. Now, definitions of what is what was that intrinsic simplicity and where it made uh, sense to use PyTorch is what you will, uh, as you keep on evolving over the class, you will get to know more and more of it. Okay. Now there are two parts of it. What you need to keep in mind: one is your base programming language, which is your base platform, and that is essentially Python. You will have libraries on top of it. Okay. And there will be something called as an IDE or an integrated developer environment. Okay. For us, this IDE is a web based IDE which we are using. It's currently running on localhost and that's called as the Anaconda environment. Uh, that, that's called as the Jupyter environment. Okay. So we are going to essentially use Jupyter notebooks for doing it. The advantage for this is that once you execute something and you store that, then it stores the HTML equivalent of this whole thing. That can be put up on GitHub the way this is done over here. That can be uh, put put on your uh, Moodle assignments as well. Because eventually we are going to give you assignments. So you will have to submit executed codes. Unexecuted codes will not be evaluated first and foremost. You will have to submit actual execution summary over there. Though we will at a point of time once you submit the execution summary we will look through it and then we might even execute it out. Okay. But you need to submit that. And the best way of submitting is that you upload these IPYNB or IPython notebook uh, files over there. Okay. Now the, uh, the, the environment looks quite something like this. Okay. Uh, not hard. If you, are in, if you want to invoke this one on your, uh, say, uh, Ubuntu based laptops or any, any of your Linux based laptops, you just need to type on your command prompt Jupyter space notebook. That should pop it up. 
If you are doing it on your Windows based systems, then uh, go into your start menu, go into Anaconda, and uh, after Anaconda, uh, you will have Jupyter notebooks or IPython notebooks, anything written down over there. Okay. We are going to stick to Python 3.7 and Torch version 1. If you have only NVIDIA GPUs, so you can have two different kinds of GPUs. There can be ones from uh, AMD as well. So we don't have an environment to support N uh, AMD GPUs as of now. Uh, NVIDIA GPUs can be supported. You would need CUDA from NVIDIA developer zone to be downloaded. So the current one is 10.3 or something of that sort. Uh, you need to download that and install it, but you will have to install CUDA before you start installing any of those. So first assess whether your laptop has an NVIDIA GPU or not. If it has, then install full CUDA, CUDA, not just the NVIDIA drivers over there. Once you have this done, then install uh, Anaconda 3.7, then install PyTorch from within uh, Conda environment. Okay. So if you go on their websites, they have all links and everything given down over there. Okay. If you have done something like this way or that way around, it's not much hard to undo it. So what you will have to do essentially is that uh, again reinstall. That's it. So if you you have installed Anaconda and then you install CUDA, then again reinstall Anaconda. It just sets in. Otherwise, these linkers will not be linked properly. That's the only issue over there. Okay. Once you do all of that, go on to GitHub. Uh, that email has that contents. I will send resend that email so that everybody gets it and. Maybe uh, one or two in the class can uh, reply to that email and, and say that we got it. So then I know that, that you essentially have that uh, email uh, on your side of it. Okay. Now, uh, what you do next after this is uh, go on to GitHub that has the GitHub link where we are going to put down uh, all our repositories. Including that, the GitHub link to these codes are also published on the course web. So over there you have that uh, small table which keeps on coming where you have the links for your slides and uh, videos. So over there you would find if it's a tutorial then there is a GitHub link as well. Okay. So similarly uh, the last class hands on tutorial where you had to calculate CNN the whole calculation details are also given now. So now you have that solution available as well so you can try it out yourselves. Okay. Now let's get into what this part is. The first part on top over here which you see this is essentially that you are going to define a uh, call up all the libraries which you need to define this neural network over there. Now what we need, the first part is uh, Torch itself. Uh, within Torch we need something which is called as uh, functional. Okay. So one way what you can do is you can import Torch directly and then within that you can go ln.functional as f and uh, any of those. But what we are trying to do essentially is instead of keeping on all of those further nestings over there, we are just going to directly link that object onto uh, alias variable over here. Now. Uh, the functional part is what we will not need now. Once we get into optimization, then I will show you where it is needed. Okay. Uh, Torch.nn has all the recipes and codes written of how to define a structure of a neural network. So what is your input neurons, output neurons? If you define that, then it internally it will uh, define all the matrices which are needed for calculations. Okay. We would need uh, NumPy as well, and that's essentially for taking in all the numeric matrices on the input and uh, whatever we are going to pass through our neural network. And uh, torch over here is to basically uh, get in all the rest of the linkers and everything. So beyond these, there are other aspects of torch as well. So there will be optimization packages, there would be regularization, normalizations, and et cetera, et cetera, as, well as we keep on coming. And you would see that they are also present over here. So we just create that uh, variable over there as well. Okay. Now, uh, nonetheless, you can have any shuffling of order. There is, there is no need that you need to write it in a particular order. Though, I mean, I would have preferred to write down torch first and then everything else, but that is not a necessary need in order to do that because it's just creating um, alias pointers over there to the main library where things are present. Okay. Uh, this was just to uh, see if torch has been properly imported, then it's supposed to get you uh, this command running and then you get down the proper version as well. So what happens is, uh, versions keep on upgrading. So you might have two different versions of uh, Python and on each of them you might have two different versions of uh, Torch included. While you would assume that you are following down one particular version's uh, coding style, uh, your environment might have been linked to the other version. And, and that's because you just forgot exactly what was linked over there. So a good way is that you just print and see it. This is for your failsafe measure. Not a mandatory part, it's just a good good practice to check whether we are on the perfect version or not. 
Next comes down this uh, multi-layer perceptron, and uh, what we are going to do over here is pretty simple. So if you remember from that uh, example of trying to classify digits, where we had a multi-layer perceptron in order to do it, okay. So what we are going to take over there is we take in uh, digits of size uh, 28 cross 28, so which was giving me essentially 784 linear uh, pixels in a linear array, okay. That was connected down to 100 neurons and that gets connected onto 10 neurons because my output is essentially a 10 plus thing over there. So here I'm essentially going to define that part. Okay. Now there are two parts of this definition which comes in. One with is, is, so this is within this block two over here. So one is that you define your multi-layer perceptrons architecture, which is what are the blocks which make it. Next you would define what is the data flow which will happen between these blocks, one block to the other block. So data flow is what is given in this forward part and, and the architecture is what is given in uh, the initialization routine over there. So assume this like this, that I have a data which is coming in, there are multiple blocks through which it will go. So first I will have to define the blocks, the definition of the blocks is within my initialization. So this is what is going to create all the memory and every uh, factors which I will need within my functions, okay. Next is I will connect one functional block to another functional block and that is my data flow connectivity which happens over there. So this part of the data flow connectivity is called as forward connectivity. When we will get into optimizations, we will also get to know about something which is called as a backward connectivity. But um, an advantage is that by using these libraries, your backward connectivities can be auto-populated. So if you have architecture and a forward given, you can yourself actually retrace the backward and that's a unique one-on-one -on -one relationship. So the first part of it is that you are going to define a linear neuron. So generally all of these uh, perceptron-like models are what are called as linear neurons. So when you get into convolutional connections, then you have something called as a conf. Now the reason for linear neuron is uh, it essentially uses a linear algebra, kind of a structure over there. That's the whole thing why it's named as linear. So what you are going to connect is 784 neurons to 100 neurons. Now look into one thing. You don't comment anything on biases. So essentially that would mean that there is a bias included in it, default, okay. Now if you are, if you don't want to have biases, so there can be uh, neural networks where you have something called as a zero bias network, which essentially means that I don't want to have this extra variable for biases, so there won't be 100 biases corresponding to 100 output neurons, but I want to set that as zero. So what you can do is, uh, yeah, so what you can do essentially is put a comma and write down uh, uh, bias equal to false. So these things are much more detailed within the Torch uh, tutorial website as well. So if you go and search for a particular function, you get the listing of all the uh, different constructs which will be used over here. So what all variables, what all labels can be given down, and then you can do that. So this defines my first fully connected layer, which I call as FC1. Now you go from FC1 onto FC2, which defines my next fully connected layer, and you connect 100 neurons onto 10 neurons over here, okay, good. Now that this part is done, we are going to get into the forward connectivity, which is the data flow connectivity over here. Now how I'm going to do the data flow connectivity is that I get an input X, okay, that's an input which comes to me. So what I do is I pass that input X through my first layer, which is FC1, okay. Here we are going to do a, a sort of a pointer overloading space itself. And not just a pointer because uh, I mean I, I, I just have this direct variable over there. So what it's going to do is by way of defining this, I'm reducing my total memory requirements. Okay. So X was an input which was 784 which came over here that gave an output of 100 and that is again mapped onto X. Now look, I mean it's essentially an array. So any variable is going to link to the, it's just pointing to the first element of that array. It's not pointing anywhere. Now, the moment if I point something to the first element of the array and then for others I don't have a pointer, then they become garbage over there. It's, it's lost out, okay. So this, by way of this, what we are essentially able to do is that I don't need to retain that anymore, that first array of 784 elements. I can pretty much purge that whole thing over there. Now this comes over here. The next part is you have a nonlinearity and the nonlinearity is going to be uh, imposed on that X itself and the nonlinearity for us is a sigmoid nonlinearity. Now look into one thing. Uh, this sigmoid was a function which is present in torch. I did not give an alias over there, so I just brought in torch.sigmoid over there, okay. Now, uh, uh, this is not a functional, this is not an architecture of any sort, okay. So I can uh, directly call this one up, 
over there. Okay. Whereas over here, because this was an architecture, so you had to call it within nn.linear. There are two parts of it. There, there is something which is just a uh, point-wise operator and there is something which is a whole matrix size operator. Now any of those matrix based operations are what are present within this construct of nn, torch dot nn and whenever you have a direct transformation over that then they are generally present uh, directly within torch library and the non-linearities are all present over there. Now you have this non-linearity over here. Uh, next what we have is uh, we take that output we pass it on to fc2 which is defined over here which takes in 100 inputs and gives you 10 outputs. So that again maps onto x and after this we have another different kind of a nonlinearity which is called as log softmax. Okay. Now for log softmax there is something interesting which happens is uh, uh, the, the normalization which it has to do for softmax uh, can be done across uh, any particular dimension. Okay. Now the point is uh, here we need to specify that dimension along which it is going to do a normalization. That's just a requirement which we need to have over here. Okay. So for that particular reason we give it out over here. Now how will mode dimensions and everything come because the point is we just have a 1D array going down over here. Now the question will be how can we get more than one dimensions over here. So we are going to get back to that one as well. So a bit later on when we start optimization I will show you exactly how this whole operation can uh, though I am pushing a 1D array but my output over there can be a 2D array though we are assuming that we push a 1D array because in general we will not be pushing a 1D array we will be giving a set of samples together to this network and getting an output and that set of samples itself is an another array. So a stack of 1D arrays will make it a 2D array so your output over here will also be a 2D array. Now the point is how do you normalize that's that's the point which comes down over here. Now once you get that then the point from this whole function is that you return and the return value is essentially x over here. Though your input was x your output return is also x but you saw that it, it gets transformed onto different pointer spaces. Okay. So can we just move up? Yes. Okay. 784 was because my input was 784. Okay. 100 were heuristically chosen. That intermediate 100 neurons is heuristically chosen. The output 10 neurons is again defined because I have a 10 class problem. So my input output that part I know in between is now as of now assume that it's heuristically chosen. So somewhere almost till the end of the class we will come to a point of how today uh, architecture designers make use of uh, certain uh, um, understanding of how data flows over there in order to change the size of these uh, neurons as well. But that's quite later on. So as of now assume that there is a heuristics over there. You can change that 100 to 120, 200, 300 there is no problem. If you make that 100 to lesser than 10 then there is generally a problem over there. Okay. Yes. Can you just go up? Okay. So this is what we did. FC1 is a reference uh, which we have created within this function itself and that is basically this whole architecture. So I have a linear neuron architecture which connects 784 neurons onto 100. So it's a multi-layer perceptron of 784 neurons onto 100 neurons with each of these output 100 neurons having their biases of itself. This whole structure is what I reference as FC1 over here. So similarly there is a different structure which I reference as FC2. FC1 and FC2 is what I have defined over here and these are alias variables, they are not functions. nn.linear is a function which you are calling. Okay. Next comes down this part. So here what we do is once you have the whole network uh, defined over there, the a, a general wise uh, point is that you would check whether it has been defined correctly or not. And the uh, general practice what we do is we just print the network over there and as in any kind of a print statement if you print it out it's going to dump out the whole thing and you can pretty much see. So this consists of two different layers FC1 and FC2. Now within FC1 what is present is you have a linear connection where your input number of features is 784, your output number of features is 100 and you have a bias. So if you said that bias equal to false over there you would say that you would see that bias equal to false comes down over here. So your total number of parameters is also reduced over there. Similarly the FC2 is what goes down over here and this is something you can use for checking whether your 
um, you are properly connected onto your input outputs over there or not. However, printing will not give you the data flow. That's the problem. So you will not get to know about the data flow over here because this just prints the architecture. You just have the structure which is printed over here. You don't have the data flow within the structure which gets printed over here. Okay. Can I just scroll up? Okay. Now, uh, a bit down, 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 down. Hold, hold. So here is uh, where we are going to calculate the model size. And that's the compute complexity estimation first part of it. So we had uh, learned in the last to last class of how to find out model sizes, which is the total number of parameters just present within the model. And from there we were gauging what is the total memory it would require for the model to be stored somewhere. Okay. Now here, this is what we start with. So first is uh, you need to list out all the parameters. It's a structure which is created. And there will be a lot of learnable parameters and, and a lot of non-learnable parameters over there. So whatever are learnable parameters is typically what is called as a parameter within, within our scope over here. Okay. A parameter essentially is a weight. Now we'll get into some kind of regularizers where you would see that there are uh, self-learnable parameters inside over there. So when you print parameters, you will get even those parameters as well. But uh, as we go on, you will get to know about it. So parameter is basically a thing which gets learned inside over there. That's a free variable. So first, what we do is we just print out what is the total number of parameters over here. Now the first parameter which it would give out is four. Now, any idea why why did it throw out four? See, you had a structure of a neural network and now what was this neural network consisting of? It had a fully connected layer, then you had a sigmoid nonlinearity, then you had another fully connected layer, and then you had a log softmax nonlinearity. So there are essentially four components which are present over here. So that's that four which gets printed over here. Now that it prints all of these four, you have a nesting, self-nesting over there. So if I go into the first structure inside that structure, so it's a structure of structures. If I get into the first structure inside that structure, then I will be able to open up the first part of it. Okay. So that's what we do. So we get into the first layer and that's by params zero over here and then print out what is the total say size or, or something which comes out over here. So what is the total number of uh, parameters over here which is basically uh, 100 into 784 that is that linear connection which comes down in terms of the matrix plus you have a bias of 100 as well. Okay and that's what comes down in this params one. Okay. Similarly you go into uh, the second layer and then you can print them out as well. Okay. Now you look into this one. So based on whether your parameters were set as true or false, you are getting down uh, two different kinds of it. So whether your, your bias will be there or not be there and accordingly there would be different number of arrays, how it's defined. Now this kind of a definition is not uh, sort of a unique thing. So it will, this is how Torch defines it. Okay. Now other libraries have other ways of defining. Some other libraries just define all parameters in this space of parameters itself. They don't segregate out everything. There are some libraries which club weights with the original matrix itself and just throw it off to you as well. So you need to look into the documentation of the library which we are doing. However, for the purpose of Torch, it's, it's straightforward. Okay. Now the point is if we want to look into the number of parameters, total number of parameters, which is our purpose over here, the way we calculated was basically you take a, take the total number of parameters over here, which is first element, uh, the first dimension into second dimension, that product, plus you add the number of biases and then you keep on doing it for the second layer and you do. So essentially over here, you can uh, run a loop in order to do that whole part over there. Now uh, that gives you uh, 79,510 parameters which is present within this network and that was I think uh, if you calculate using the model complexity calculations which we had done in the class, you would also be getting the same thing as well. Okay. So this was about defining a neural network. So see, we have not yet started training a neural network. And that will happen after we get into the control plane or the optimization solver over there. So this was just to show you how do we write down the first part of a neural network and get down the model size. There are parts before this. So what comes before defining a neural network? The data part of it. So the data handling routines we haven't yet done. And what happens after defining a neural network? the control plane of the problem where the optimization takes place. So we are yet to get into the optimization. So that is what we will start on Wednesday. So once we do optimization, then you would see the data part which will come before the model definition and the optimization part which will come after the model definition over there. And then you have a neural network which you have trained. 
and then we will get into something which is the forward inferencing or the calculations out of a neural network. Okay. Uh, now, Vikas, can you just uh, go back on this one and uh, click on tutorial two? Okay, and then just move it up. So this is the second one. So essentially you can also do, you have the link given to the first tutorial and it's placed under one single repository. So either you can uh, create a clone for that repository and keep on uh, cloning every time you have an update that will also work out uh, whatever way you want to do. So if you are using GitHub on desktop, then you can create a, uh, what is that called as activity triggered clone. So anytime there is a refresh on the library, you are going to clone down the updates on the library over that on your local repository. That works out generally good. It's a generally good practice because then you don't have to remember to clone every time over there and you can keep on modifying yourself. Your modifications are not lost and new modifications on the core over there are also reflected over here. Now here uh, the first part is going to remain the same where you have the libraries uh, and, and the uh, different functions within libraries which you are calling. Now the next part which comes down is essentially your definition for the model. Okay. Now here we are going to use this uh, model called as Linet and that's what we had studied in the CNN uh, class as well. Now the difference which comes in is that I don't have a NN dot uh, linear connectivity because here it's no more a linear algebra which is going to define the connectivity but I have a convolutional operation and here it's a 2D convolutional operation. Now for any kind of a 2D convolutional operation what you need to define is essentially what is the number of channels in my input, the first part of it. Next is you need to define what is the number of channels in my output. Next you will have to define what is my uh, kernel size. Okay. Now look over here. Uh, my input was a grayscale image for my linear. Okay. So that becomes a one channel thing. My first layer had uh, six output channels, so that becomes six over here and my kernels were of size five cross five. Okay. Now after convolution, we had a max pool layer over there and it was also max pooling over 2D space. So uh, the kernel size for max pooling was two cross two and it was also to max pooling at a stride of two. Okay. Now if we don't mention stride in case of convolution or for pooling, then it uh, would assume the default stride and the default stride for these ones is one but still always make a, in, ensure that you check through the library in order to see what are defaults. So uh, a good practice in general is that uh, don't assume defaults, whatever you want code it explicitly. In that case you know that defaults can change from one version to the other version and then you don't uh, basically end up messing the program from one version to the other version. Because nobody says that uh, defaults will have to be preserved across versions. It, it depends on what kind of speed ups are being put and that's the basic definition for a default. Uh, and in that case, if you want to have a functional intactness throughout the whole uh, life cycle of this one product, then a good idea is that you define defaults as well. Okay. But then that's the difference between your people who do research and people who would do a product side of it. So people in research, I mean, we try to save our time a lot. So we will not be defining defaults because I don't want to use that extra amount of time over there to waste on this one. Now, you get down onto max pool, you have your kernel size and your stride defined over here. Next you have the second convolution layer which takes in six channel input. It generates 16 channel output and uh, there are five cross five sized convolution kernels over here. Now after that you again have a max pooling operation and over here uh, we had come down to something like 16 cross uh, five cross five if I remember. That was the size of the tensor which essentially meant that we had 400 neurons if you linearize out. And then we had a linear connectivity over here through a fully connected layer. So that was connecting 400 neurons onto 120 neurons, 120 neurons onto 84 and 84 onto 10. Now as we had discussed like how did we choose this 120, 84 and 10 that was up to Jan Lekan and how he was optimizing that whole part. Now uh, earlier days this was one of the most grueling exercises which you would do. You would heuristically choose different values and see which one is coming good or bad and, and then accordingly keep it. But uh, over these years that we have learned to do this in a very bad way. Um, so some of us decided that we would go and figure out methods of how to do it more intelligently. Okay. So there are methods of uh, creating a bigger network from a smaller network, creating a fatter network from a thinner network, uh, as well as creating a lean and slim smaller network from a bigger network as well. So there are things like net to net, 
uh, and uh, network to network transfers of learned weight. There is something called as uh, efficient net. Uh, these are stuff which we will study a bit later on in the class. When, when you are thorough with optimization and lot of architectures and search, then we'll get into how to optimize architectures itself. And then how to optimize architectures itself is again a machine learning problem itself. So, so it's almost like a machine learning engine is writing a code in order to do machine learning. Machine learning for machine learning, if, if you, you may call it by that crazy name as well. So if I remember clearly, I think uh, NeurIPS had a track on that, ML for ML. So the, that's how the community is going out now. Okay, now here, uh, if you get into this part, you have your model definition which is created. So all of your blocks are pointed out. So um, we're just gonna move up. And then we have this forward pass of it defined. Okay, now look over here. I have the first one which is a convolution over here. I take that same one and then pass it through pooling. After pooling, I had the rectified linear unit, my nonlinearity operation. Now this nonlinearity operation over here, if you see, they are within that functional F. So that is no more within torch. Now look into a difference. For sigmoid, I had it within torch. For nonlinearities like Le ReLU, I have it within functional. Now the best way of it is that search through that library, which is nested within which particular part over there, and then use only that one. Okay. Now we get down uh, uh, this output over here, then I pass it through the second convolutional uh, layer, and then I keep on doing the same thing. Now comes down the fun part over here, is when you have to linearize that 25, uh, sorry, 16 cross 5 cross 5 sized tensor into a 400 element array. What we do is we use this particular one which is called as uh, view. Okay, this is essentially a resize operator and nothing more. Within torch, this is essentially a resize operation which you might have within uh, say NumPy or any of them. Okay, what it does is the moment you put down this first one as minus one. So minus one is to give down what is the priority of the first dimension. So minus one essentially says that use a column major and just linearize it out. So you linearize that one out, you get down 400 neurons but you will have to specify this part as well. Otherwise what it does is, you can have any arbitrary size tensor. It will first make it flatten out by virtue of this minus one and then rearrange it in some way. Now a default rearrangement for this one is uh, a 2D and then that creates a problem. Uh, but we need a 1D array. So a 2D would also be 400 cross one. But remember within your programming constructs, a 400 cross one is not same as 400. Because it, it, there will be a dimension mismatch within the array definition itself. Though you know that it's going to consume the same amount of memory and it's, it has the same structure over there. So this creates that 400 element 1D array, which goes into your next part. And either you can have this ReLU after this pool or after linearization you can have the ReLU. Any, any one of these places, it would mean the same thing. So we have, uh, uh, so what we do is we put this 400 over here and then pass it on to through this one. Then the output again goes on to the fully connected and the output comes down over here and here we uh, get it through a log softmax coming out over there. Okay, now that uh, this output is present over here, I'm going to, so one is like either you can have x equal to f dot log softmax of whatever is this one and then return x or uh, <coughs> you can directly return this last part of it. Any one of them is going to work because I don't need to retain that x anymore. Can we move up? So now if you look into the model definition over here, so you print it out and you get down that set. Now see within your uh, uh, convolution, it, it explicitly specifies what is your kernel size in 2D, though we had given only one parameter over that. So if one parameter is passed out, then it assumes that X and Y is symmetry. If two parameters are explicitly passed, then it would put that one. So sometimes you might have to use say a five cross three kernel or a five cross seven kernel, any of these. Now, these are again domain to domain dependent. So when we get into something on medical applications, I would show you that essentially my X direction and Y direction, my samplings are very different. So I might need to have uh, a non-isotropic kernel as well over there. Now, and the stride is also explicitly defined as a X direction stride and a Y direction stride. Now for pooling, you see similarly, <coughs> what is your kernel size for the pool? What is your stride size for the pool? whether you are using any padding or not, whether there is a dilation or not, and uh, whether there is a ceiling being imposed or not. So ceiling in a sense is that if the value is above a certain value, then whether you will have a numeric ceiling uh, imposed on that. And that sometimes is needed because your output, uh, you might need your output in eight bits. So which would mean that if it's an unsigned eight bit, then you will have uh, zero to 255. So you might have to seal 
the upper value over that though your input may be a floating point value which can go up to any range say a million or something over that now that can also be put down within this uh, uh, max pool layer as a function then you get into your second convolution layer then you get into your second max pooling and then you get into your uh, fully connected layers over here which are done through a linear combination okay now we get into the uh, parameter size calculations over here now there are uh, essentially these uh, convolutions their biases and then you keep on doing now if you keep on counting 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 and that's the pointers which is giving on the first layer over there and that's that first number of parameters which is within the network okay now if i get into the first structure within that network and then start looking into it so that's what we do through this uh, loop over here which is going to probe on a 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 kind of a basis so the 0 at 1 uh, sorry it will start at 0 and it will go up to 9 so the 0 at 1 is the convolution once weight now that structure is something like uh, it has uh, six such convolution kernels each of size 1 cross 5 cross 5 that's what we were clear so our convolution uh, kernel size was essentially number of input channels into the spatial span over there and i have six of such so that's this what this structure gives me next you have biases and corresponding to each convolution kernel i will have one bias so there are six biases next you get into your uh, second convolution kernel there are 16 such convolution kernels each of size 6 cross 5 cross 5 because your input to the second layer is a six channel input so your convolution kernel is of size 6 cross 5 cross 5 from there we get into uh, the number of biases which is 16 over here and uh, so on and so forth so we get into our fully connected layer in terms of the weights and bias weights and bias and finally this is my total calculation over the total number of parameters over there okay so you can do a pen and paper calculation in terms of 6 into 1 into 5 into 5 plus 6 and then again do 16 into 6 into 5 into 5 plus 16 then 120 into 400 plus 400 then uh, uh, 84 into 1 uh, sorry 120 into 400 plus uh, 120 this will be 84 into 120 plus 84 then uh, uh, 10 into 84 plus 10 and you would get down that the that number is the same as this particular number which comes down over here okay so that's where we come to an end for this one yes 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 no 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 so so essentially that is dependent on what is your input size so because our input was 28 cross 28 uh, no 32 cross 32 so that's the reason in the output we got down a 16 cross 5 cross 5 now if this was not 32 cross 32 obviously that spatial span instead of 5 cross 5 that will change to something else and accordingly you will have to change so that's one of the reasons you need to keep in mind that the data set size the spatial span of that image which goes into these kind of a network needs to be pretty much defined over here let's let's when we get into the optimization i will get back on to what that loft of max and the dimension part of it handles uh, what are we inheriting from where yes uh, just go up which which part ha this this part over there uh, i did not get your question No. Oh, so the whole reason for doing this one is that once you define it as a module class over there, so during doing your backward calculation in optimization, that needs a particular function to be defined in a module. Otherwise, it will not be able to invoke the auto backward calculator over there. So once we get into the optimization, then I will open up the whole network and show you exactly what is a backward calculation, which means taking derivatives and multiplying it with some, some activations over there. But in order to do that, it will need a pointer assessment of exactly what, what all things are present. And until that is defined in a particular way, you will not be able to do that. So it needs to retain some parts and do that. And that is by virtue of defining it within a module itself. Okay, so if the class is not of that type, then you will not be able to calculate. That's that's a limitation from the library design perspective. That's it. Okay, so uh, we stop over here. I mean, if others who have doubts, you can keep on asking me. And uh, then, uh, because I have done a walkthrough, so 
get these two executed. So just don't download, I mean, if you download and see, it will always be running over there. So please uh, clean all the variables and uh, do a step-by-step, cell-by-cell execution over there. Then these numbers should change for your case. And then see whether it's working. And then if there are pitfalls where you are stuck at this stage itself, then uh, come back and clear that in the first 30 minutes on Wednesday class.